With this presentation, we will take a deeper dive into the rubber oligomers because everyone who has uh, performed an extractable and leachable evaluation of a small volume parenteral drug product will have come across these kinds of uh, compounds already. You will see them in vials, for instance, with a rubber stopper. You will see them in pre-filled syringes uh, with, with a plunger or cartridges with a plunger or sealing disc. The problem here uh, with the rubber oligomers is not that they will not be detected. In most cases, they will be detected. They will potentially not be identified. Um, the reason for that is that they are not uh, present in any commercially available mass spectral library. And for uh, labs who do not have too much experience with extractables and leachable studies, for these labs, uh, these compounds will remain unknown uh, compounds. However, in the safety and quality assessments of those compounds being present in a drug product, it's of crucial importance to be able to identify and uh, assess those compounds. What we will discuss today is uh, the structure of these uh, rubber oligomers, their formation, how do you detect them and how do you identify them, what is their reactivity, for instance, for uh, drug products and drug product ingredients, and also um, what is their reactivity in, a, in the rubber itself. And then we'll uh, close with uh, some final thoughts on their toxicity. But let's start with their structure. So those uh, rubber oligomers actually have two different uh, oligomers. You have the C13 oligomer and the C21 oligomer when they are not uh, halogenated. Um, they are typically cyclic aliphatic hydrocarbon compounds with one double bond and they are formed during the polymerization process of the butyl rubber or uh, during the rubber curing at high temperatures. Typically, um, these oligomers are a mixture of isomers. Uh, for the C13 oligomer, you have one pair of enantiomers and for the C21 oligomer, you have two pairs of diastasis theoremeric uh, and uh, enantiomers, as it is shown here on this slide. Once they are brominated or chlorinated, for instance, if you use uh, bromobutyl, chlorobutyl uh, rubbers, um, they get this uh, structure. And uh, because they are brominated or chlorinated, they are considered as uh, allyl halides because uh, of the fact that they are halogenated. Um, they are considered as alkylating agents with one double bond. And when you perform a structure activity relationship assessment, uh, in, in silico assessment of their toxicity, uh, in other words, they come out as uh, being potentially uh, carcinogen. Um, so the, the way they uh, come out is that carcinogenicity is, in humans is plausible. So that immediately triggers uh, a red flag, a kind of alert. However, no experimental literature data is known about the toxicity of these compounds. How are they formed? Uh, in order to explain how they are formed, I need to take uh, one step back and look at the polymerization process of a butyl elastomer. And that is a cationic polymerization. So uh, that polymerization starts off with a catalyst, which is typically a Lewis acid, um, boron uh, trifluoride, for instance, or uh, aluminum tri trichloride. However, uh, uh, for the ease of a representation, I've uh, um, shown it here via a proton. So what happens in the initiation of the uh, polymerization is that uh, the uh, double bond, which is electron rich, will attack um, the positive, positive charge of the proton and uh, a carbocation uh, will be formed. And in the propagation, that means in the next steps of the polymerization, uh, other isobutyl, uh, isobutene um, monomers will be added uh, in the process. And that's how you create a living uh, cationic polymerization chain. 
from time to time, um, also isoprene uh, units or monomers will be uh, encountered during that polymerization process because the mixture of monomers is for 98 to 99 percent isobutene and 1 to 2 percent um, isopropene. And as you can see, that's the way how you incorporate uh, insaturation into the backbone of the uh, butyl elastomer, which is very important uh, when you consider the next steps in the process, which is the curing or the vulcanization or cross-linking of the rubber. Now uh, that we have, expl have explained how the uh, formation of the uh, butyl elastomer is, is uh, done, for the C13 oligomer, the initiation uh, of the uh, reaction does not happen with isobutene, but with isopropene, as you can see. So um, the double bond of a isopropene uh, monomer attacks the positive charge of the Lewis acid. And that's how a carbocation uh, is formed and in other subsequent steps, two other uh, isobutene monomers are added and uh, you create uh, some kind of uh, cation that where, the, where there's a kind of intramolecular attack to form some kind of a ring closure which creates the C13 carbocation and with abstraction of a proton um, the ring is closed and uh, a stable C13 oligomer is, um, is being formed. For the C21 oligomer, um, the reaction uh, continues with the C13 carbocation, as you have seen on the previous slide. First, there's a proton shift, uh, and which makes sure that the positive charge uh, in that carbocation is located on the uh, cyclohexane ring, which is more stable. And then afterwards, in the propagation step, two other um, monomers are added, uh, isobutene monomers are added, and that uh, creates the uh, C21 carbocation. And with abstraction again, or deprotonation, um, you create the stable C21. Of course, uh, now I have explained uh, how C13 and C21 are formed, but the most delicate um, uh, rubber oligomers are the uh, brominated and chlorinated oligomers. So in order to explain that, and you also need to explain how you create uh, or um, synthesize a bromobutyl elastomer. And that is via the bromination of a butyl elastomer. So as you can see here, the polymer chain, uh, the butyl uh, elastomer polymer chain will be brom brominated by adding brom bromine and by formation of a bromonium uh, intermediate and subsequent abstraction of hydrogen bromide you will create the uh, bromobutyl elastomer. That also explains uh, the exp ab uh, abstraction of a uh, hydrogen uh, bromide, uh, why you will see residual bromide uh, in the rubber, and that is also why you need an acid scavenger, because hydrogen bromide, which is a very uh, aggressive uh, acid, needs to be neutralized, and that you can do, for instance, by adding calcium stearate. Along with the bromination of the uh, butyl elastomer, also the oligomers uh, will be brominated. Um, and that's what you can see here in this reaction. Also, uh, the brom bromine will uh, attack the double bond uh, of the C13 oligomer, form a bromonium intermediate, and then um, with abstraction of a hydrogen bromide uh, molecule, you will see that the stable C13 bromide uh, will be formed. How do we detect uh, those uh, oligomers? That is typically with headspace GCMS for the more volatile oligomers. Uh, this is a typical um, chromatogram that you will see if you perform a headspace GCMS on a rubber. For instance, on a neat uh, rubber where you heat the rubber and you try to identify every compound that is released from the rubber. And you'll see that uh, compound uh, 46 uh, relates to the C13 uh, oligomer that is not brominated. And you can see the molecular ion at 180 um, Dalton. And 
at the very end of the chromatogram you see the C13 brominated, uh, which has a um, molecular ion of 200, uh, 260. And you also see, because of the natu natural abundancy of bromine, that um, there's one uh, bromide in the, um, in the ele uh, elemental formula of the, uh, of the oligomer. You also will detect uh, those compounds with uh, GCMS, and actually with GCMS you can see them all. You see the early eluting C13 uh, oligomer, a little bit later at the retention time of 13 minutes in our chromatography. You see the bromide uh, C13 coming off, and there you can see already that it's not one peak, but it's a cluster of peaks, and that relates to the different isomers um, that will exist uh, in, the, in the rubber. Uh, the highest peak uh, you will see coming from uh, the C21 uh, oligomer, and then uh, the C21 uh, brominated comes a little bit later, again in cluster form, because there also you have different isomers um, that relate to that structure. This slide, I will not um, dwell on this too much. That's how you can explain certain mass fragments uh, because of the uh, um, cleavage that will happen during the electron impact ionization. So it explains uh, why you see those mass fragments and how they could relate to the fragments. Now let's talk about uh, the reactivity of those uh, rubber oligomers. Um, and certainly the... Uh, brominated and chlorinated uh, forms of the oligomers, they are considered as uh, allyl bromides or allyl chlorides, and they are considered as alkylating agents. That means that they can go into a, a nucleophilic substitution reaction. And this is a first uh, example where we see a reaction with an uh, API, uh, where a uh, thiodiazo um, adduct is formed um, through an abstraction of that functional group from an antibiotic, for instance, where you see the adduct formation both with the C13 and C21 oligomer. Another example is the reaction with an excipient. Here um, I've chosen the example of the excipient glycine, and you can clearly see that the C21 oligomer reacts with the glycine to form an adduct 2. Another example is uh, not only with the excipients, but also with some of the impurities of the excipients. Uh, you can see the uh, adduct formation here. Um, it is a fatty acid. It could be stearic acid. It could be a palmitic acid, for instance. That is an impurity of polysorbate 20. And here also you see an adduct formation between the C21 oligomer and the um, um, the fatty acid. Also, proteins and peptides can undergo uh, a reaction with uh, the brominated oligomers. I've uh, displayed here a, a peptide that consists of lysine, cysteine and histidine because they have three different functional groups that could interact with the C13 C uh, bromide oligomer. You have the amine uh, function in a lysine you have the thiol group in the cysteine, and you have the imidazole ring in the histidine uh, amino acid. And all three of those functional groups can interact uh, via a uh, nucleophilic substitution reaction with the brominated oligomer. And last but not least, uh, also um, there may be a reaction not only with a drug product or drug product ingredients, but also reactions in the rubber itself. Um, those reactions occur during the formation of the rubber during the uh, curing process. And I've shown that the first three uh, examples are the interaction between the rubber oligomers and uh, a crosslinker, um, which is obvious because also those crosslinkers will be uh, highly reactive because they need to um, bond the different um, polymer chains in a reactive way. But also, for instance, palmitic acid or stearic acid, which is uh, typically the acid scavenger in a, in a rubber, may react with um, the, rubber the halogenated uh, rubber oligomers. 
not only those uh, compounds, but also, for instance, antioxidants or um, ESBO uh, can react with those uh, oligomers. And that also explains why um, an extraction profile of a rubber may be so complex and may contain so many unknown compounds because all of these compounds will not be available in commercially available mass spectra libraries. Now to close, uh, we'll have a look at the toxicity. Um, when we're looking at the oligomers that are not halogenated, um, they are, like I said already, they are cyclic aliphatic hydrocarbons with one double bond. And the only way to know something about their toxicity is to perform a structure activity relationship assessment. And there the outcome is that there's no immediate concern. Um, however, there's no uh, experimental literature data to confirm that, so you can only rely on a SAR assessment to perform your tox evaluation. The situation becomes different when you look at the halogenated uh, aliphatic hydrocarbons, um, the uh, rubber oligomers that are halogenated. They are considered as alkylating agents, so there's a concern about their reactivity, which we have discussed already but also um, they come out in a structure activity relationship assessment as a potentially carcinogenic and as a sensitizer. And again, because there's no experimental data, that's the only source you can rely on to perform your, uh, your um, safety evaluation on. So the, as a conclusion, they come out as uh, compounds of high concern. Now, um, what does it mean in terms of qualification um, of those compounds? That means that uh, the FDA looks at um, an SCT or a safety concern threshold in chronic treatments for those compounds at 1.5 micrograms per day and for non-chronic treatments at 5 micrograms per day. And that is related to the potential sensitization uh, potential. Now, because we have all those oligomers here available at Nelson Labs, we did a further um, evaluation on their toxicity. So we performed AIMS testing uh, on the C13 brominated and C13 uh, chlorinated oligomer, as well as we did a lymph, local lymph node assay uh, test on the C13 brominated to, to um, detect any potential sensitization issues and that allows you to do a, a correct assessment of the true toxicological risk for those legibles. And with this I would like to end my presentation and thank you for your attention. If there would be any question around uh, this subject uh, there is a Q&A session uh, afterwards so please feel free to ask any questions or send your questions to infoeurope at uh, nelsonlabs.com. Thank <music> you.